And so let's go ahead and get started. We have a terrific group of people who are here. We have War Euron, who is here from LifeWire, Valencia Peterson, and Alan Heidkamp, who are here from the University of Northern Iowa. And so this group we really picked out because of the work that they're doing across the country, um, and also because I think they all have a very unique story that they can tell about the work they're doing as well as they have been doing the work for a while. So we're really excited to have them here. And kind of the way we're going to do this, we're going to go through and we're going to take, take each person and allow an opportunity to kind of have a conversation about the work that they're doing and hear about that work, but also just why they thought sport was important. Um, we believe that, you know, not only are they doing good work, but I think that this is an opportunity for people to learn from and get inspired from in a way that they can also uh, potentially do work with the sport field around this issue. So we're going to go ahead and start with Ward. Uh, Ward, we're really excited to have you here. You have been actually utilizing coaching boys and the men in um, the state of Washington for over 20 years. Uh, and, and, and funny too, you kind of got into this work. I remember you were telling me that you actually started, I think, at law. Like, so this is not something that you naturally came into as a, as a preventionist or as a social worker. You were actually in law, I think you were telling me that, um, which I thought was kind of a really cool way that you, you got into the work. Um, you actually co-founded the Men's Nash, uh, Network Against Domestic Violence in 2004. And you've been at, how long have you been at LifeWire? I've been at LifeWire for uh, six and a half years now. And okay. so I've <clears throat> been doing Coaching Boys and Men uh, and Mentors in Violence Prevention the entire time that I've been here. Okay. And you've, and you've, and you've been working uh, primarily in Seattle and the East King County, I remember that you were telling me. Um, That's right. We're really, we're really thankful to have you here. And, you know, one of the first questions I kind of wanted to ask you uh, along with just tell us a little about the work that you're doing in athletics, but also just the work that LifeWire is doing. Sure. Okay. Well, um, so LifeWire is a, an organization that um, was founded about 35 years ago uh, by a group of concerned citizens that were responding to two domestic violence homicides that occurred in the city of Bellevue um, back in 1982, one of whom was a, a law enforcement officer. Uh, and those community members got together and uh, <laughs> uh, those community members got together and began um, a, a crisis line, basically, that, that they staffed um, voluntarily 24 hours a day for about um, about five years before they got some funding. Uh, they eventually acquired a, a shelter and several different uh, programs have developed since then to where it's now the largest uh, comprehensive domestic violence program in the state of Washington. Um, about six years ago, uh, the, the board of directors uh, got together and challenged the then executive director to develop a prevention strategy that would um, eventually put the need for LifeWire and its critical services out of, out of business. Um, and so they began um, crafting a strategy, and then shortly after that hired me to come in and lead their social change uh, strategy uh, that would, um, across a number of different community sectors, really engage at um, the, the social norm level around um, developing leadership models and engaging leaders of various communities to begin to shift the cultural and social norms that give rise to uh, violence. And so that mission statement was recrafted um, from a very, uh, you know, kind of crisis-oriented one to one that uh, is, is about shifting the, the institutional, societal, and attitude, societal beliefs and attitudes that ultimately give rise to domestic and sexual violence. Excellent. Um, so what, tell me a little bit about uh, some of the work that you, and I know that you work with, with, uh, with not just uh, young men, but you also work with young women as well. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you take into consideration when you're working with female athletes in prevention? Yeah, first of all, I just, I have to acknowledge that, that my colleague, uh, Rebecca Milliman, uh, is the uh, expert in this arena. She uh, co-developed uh, the uh, organization, or I'm sorry, the, the curriculum called Athletes as Leaders. Um, and 
implemented that at uh, a, a local um, Seattle school here where they had had a number of um, challenges and problems with, with uh, gender-based violence. Um, I think one of the things that uh, is was so often, you know, 10 years ago, or, uh, you know, 10, 12, 14 years ago when we were first starting to do coaching boys into men with coaches around the state, um, we were always asked almost immediately after uh, introducing the curriculum and the program and talking about the the benefits of leveraging coaches' relationship with their uh, high school and, and collegiate athletes, um, we were immediately asked, well, what about the girls? Um, and so often we were just like, uh, well, you know, initially that's not where the problem lies. Um, but because of school administrators and educators' perspective on having to provide um, inclusive education and opportunities for all genders in their school environments, that wasn't a satisfactory answer. Um, and, and so we, we were at a loss. And thank God Rebecca and her colleagues um, developed the Athletes as Leaders program to begin to engage young uh, female-identified athletes as leaders in this effort. Because uh, not only from a Title IX perspective and an inclusivity perspective, but as Bell Hooks says, you know, patriarchy is not gendered. And what we need is a comprehensive, multi-gendered approach to being able to um, engage leaders at all levels and all genders, regardless of what their stance or station is in life, and be able to um, empower them with knowledge, information, and access to leadership opportunities so that they can practice that in a way that shifts the culture within their communities. And so uh, women play a huge role in that, not only for other women, but also for men um, and, and male-identified athletes particularly. I think um, one, one coach that I worked with in eastern Washington told me a story uh, that, that predates athletes as leaders, but he said, you know, we can do all this great work, but all it takes is one critical comment from a uh, a student, a female student, uh, or peer of one of my male athletes, and and if that critical comment undercuts our work, it it seems like it sets us back to ground zero. And so, I think that's just one reason why it is so critical for us to engage folks of all genders, <clears throat> and particularly to begin to see women as leaders who can be empowered to do this work, and as a result really begin to um, celebrate and demonstrate gender e equity in their violence prevention efforts. And also, you know, like being able to demonstrate in action and in, in our commitment to women's leadership uh, in this effort overall. Lord, as we're talking, I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as the years have moved on, do you feel like when you talk to administrators that are interested or – um, athletic directors, do you ever feel like they're now asking, hey, do you have something for both groups? Do you, do you think that's increasing? Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, as, as Rebecca has seen and, and certainly many others have, have experienced around uh, the country is, is that when we offer this as a comprehensive program for, an entire, for the entire athletic department, um, it just becomes that much more potent a force for change within those communities. You know, one of the other things um, when we were talking uh, about this, putting this together, you told me about your work that you're doing in private schools. And uh, I think that there are sometimes when, I, when I'm out and about and I talk to people, everybody talk about we're trying to get into schools, and a lot of times what they're talking about is, is public schools. Um, you, you, you're doing a little bit of work uh, with the private schools. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, about that work and just kind of, what, are, what are some of the unique factors about working in a private school? Um, or what is unique about that work that you're doing with private schools? Well, one of the things I think that's um, unique to private schools is that they tend to have a smaller, less complicated leadership structure, which, uh, um, you know, when you're engaging leaders to be able to, to gain entree to a student body, um, that, that administrative leadership structure can be very complicated and, and 
onerous in navigating and, and trying to find out all the different political considerations and concerns that that particular uh, administration is dealing with uh, is challenging. And so dealing with a smaller leadership structure, in my experience, is a lot easier. It's a lot easier to gain access to the folks that make decisions and that influence change. Um, and, and I think also the fact that um, while, while it, it also, you know, that can serve as a vulnerability too, because it, if you run into a roadblock or somebody that's just not willing uh, to engage, then, then obviously it can shut things down rather, relatively quick too. But less red tape in my experience leads to greater likelihood of success and greater high likelihood of engaging that community. Um, and I think also that there's also greater leverage to be able to talk about the uh, policy uh, level changes that need to occur within that community uh, and affect those decision makers in a way that, that can um, result in uh, community-wide change relatively rapidly because you're just dealing with a smaller bureaucracy. Um, and so I think you know the, both of those things can be leveraged both for access and to remind the leadership of the school that if they're going to walk the talk, they, they need to have a commitment and fidelity to the pro-social elements of both coaching boys and men and athletes as leaders, as well as how those support their overall uh, school climate. You know, and I, I think most administrators want to have a positive uh, school climate for learning and, and uh, community involvement. And when we can show them and demonstrate that uh, there are programs, evidence-based programs that do support that, then they become uh, very strong allies and very strong supporters of the program. Um, and that's, that's been my experience, at least at the, at the local level, in dealing with private schools and how they differ from public schools in, in terms of ease of engagement uh, and then also just being able to impact that community in a more uh, effective and concentrated manner. So, you know, as, we, as you were talking about with just administrators and, and also just talking about, I think, just, uh, you know, how helping, you know, that it, it takes relationships. It takes uh, maintaining not just relationships with those administrators, but finding a way to, to, once you're done that first year, like how do you find a way to get back in front of them that second time, so that kind of brings up the question, how do you maintain your relationship with school leaders and, and administrators? And just to make sure that this isn't like a one and done, but actually something that people want to continue on, and, and not just continue, but actually want to get continually be updated about ways to improve or to know more about the issue. Well, I think, I, I think it's just so critical to, to first of all, place a, a value on the relationship as a paramount um, element of doing any kind of effective prevention work. And, I, and that, in my experience, that doesn't just apply to schools. It's anything that you're doing in any community is going to be based on the, the, the quality uh, and the integrity of the relationship that you're able to develop with leaders within that community. And that, and that certainly does apply to schools and school administration. Um, so one of the things that I've done is that once I've determined that there's good um, commitment to the program and that there's a readiness to engage uh, in change work, um, then, you know, and, and training them in the curriculum or the program and making sure that there's fidelity to that program, then I just make sure that I'm constantly, without overwhelming them, um, sharing information with them, latest research, um, best practices, success stories that come from the field, um, training opportunities and seminars and webinars that, that we can invite them to, to engage them in that way uh, as a means of continued uh, both encouragement and motivation, but also can, opportunities for connection. Um, and then where possible, um, I really like to be able to, to develop a couple of leaders that can ultimately co-present with me for instance, last year, our Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence uh, asked me to present to a group of educators in rural eastern Washington. And, um, and so I, I saw it as a great opportunity to include one of the coaches that I've been working with for quite a while at, at uh, one of the all-boys Catholic schools that I'm working in. And, and um, so I invited Coach Beck to come with me and share of his own experiences and give him basically half the day to present uh, on the practical implications of 
of um, implementing a Coaching Boys and the Men uh, program. And it just, it really uh, it served both as an opportunity to grow his skills, but it also uh, was a vote of confidence in his, in his uh, leadership capacity. And then also the school that he's from saw that as a, uh, we were able to pay them for his time. And they were, you know, greatly appreciative of, of the money as well as uh, the opportunity to, to highlight his skills on the public stage. You know, and then also just things like dropping by with a Starbucks card and saying, hey, great job on that last um, talk. I know that you were, I know that you were having a, a, a challenge in um, getting, getting the nerve to talk about consent with your athletes. Uh, good job. Way to go. Um, and just a lot of, you know, so a lot of, encouragement, a lot of uh, communication, and really consistency in terms of following through. That, that the one thing I've seen is that whenever you say you're going to do something, you must deliver. And, and also just like um, providing extra incentive wherever there's possible to, to encourage them to continue on. Perfect. Thanks, Ward. I really appreciate it. I think, uh, I think if anybody has an opportunity, I mean, I think to, to connect with you about the work you're doing, I think you, you the, the doing work across both genders and also just making sure that we also include private schools, is, uh, I think it's something that a lot of people don't realize is that that is also an opportunity to go in and that there are sometimes maybe even a bit easier to possibly, not all the time, but maybe to get into um, and then just that important of a relationship. So I know Ashley, yeah, you had you had a question for us that you wanted to put out there? Yeah, well, so there's some questions coming up in the audience, um, but I also thought this would be a great time to hear from our audience. Um, and so our question is, what are some other groups in athletics that we should be including in discussions around prevention? Um, and so we'd love for you all to, to think about that and let us know your thoughts. Um, you know, things that you think are things that you're already doing. You know, what groups are in athletics are you engaging with? Um, and then Brian and Ward, there, so there's been quite a few questions actually that have come up. But the first one that I wanted to pose is from Lucia. Um, and Lucia is looking for, and I think this is kind of like the million dollar question, and Ward, you did talk about this, but do you have any secrets <laughs> Um, to getting coaches not just involved, but in, like that continued, sustained engagement. Yeah, it's you know I think one of the things that frustrated me, and it still is frustrating at times, is just um, realizing that that the bandwidth of coaches is um, pretty crowded in terms of uh, obligations and things that they're that they're doing. It's real easy to kind of um, I think, especially coming from a um, a, a pro-feminist analysis to be able to kind of look at the lack of interest or the lack of engagement by coaches as somehow a, an outgrowth of their own uh, patriarchal privilege, uh, et cetera. But, but in my experience, when I get behind, when we kind of get behind the, the veil, it's really not that as much as it is just extreme busyness. You know, there's just like, for every kid that they're working with and for every administrator that, that they report to, there's an obligation that they're, um, that, that they're not sharing with you, but that they're dealing with, and it's crowding their capacity to be able to uh, actively engage. So a lot of times it's not a lack of interest. I think it's a, a lack of capacity. And so we have to be uh, empathetic, I think, in our approach around that, and then also realize that, um, you know, just like we, if we engage individuals um, in in efforts to change their behavior, we we usually use a readiness to change assessment to be able to kind of limit our frustration and increase our efficacy in how we approach them. And I think the same applies for coaches. Is like, you know, what is what's your motivation? What are you interested in? And and I think where possible, getting to know if there's, you know, if they have the capacity for you to get to know them and become a supporter generally of their program before you just come in with your own agenda, it can be helpful. Um, the other thing that I think is absolutely critical, and I would say this is the thing that I have seen consistently uh, be the difference between effective engagement and ineffective engagement is where I have an, another person who's a member of that community 
who I can develop a relationship with, who is a booster or an alumni or some other member of that school community who um, can leverage their influence around the, the adoption of pro-social change elements like coaching boys and a man or athletes as leaders. So that, you know, it is, I think it's really critical and really helpful to have an outside supporter. So like in my case, I had an alum from the school that I'm working at, the, the private school, who was a, a graduate of that athletic, of the football program, who was a prosecutor at the, at the prosecutor's office where I worked for 20 years. And I used him as a outside influencer to begin putting pressure on the athletic director to, to gain access to the coaching, uh, his athletes. And that was ultimately the thing that was successful. And in every other school where I've seen year over year sustained involvement, there's somebody, whether it's a school leader, administrator, or an outside influencer who has been able to bring that influence into that program and begin to do that work effectively to where it's sustained year over year. Great. Thank you so much, Ward. I think those are some really good tips um, and insight that you that you shared. And um, there's been some other questions coming up um, around implementing coaching boys into men and athletes as leaders. Um, I think um, we, for the sake of time, we'll um, get to those um, maybe in our, our bigger discussion that we're going to have. But I just wanted to, um, for everyone, kind of pull out some of the answers to the text chat questions because I think there were a lot of um, great suggestions for people that need to be included. And so there was um, several people who pointed to, you know, how are we um, including and centering trans and gender nonconforming students and LGBTQIA plus um, athletes? Um, are we engaging trainers, um, captains of, of athletics teams, the parents, not leaving out sports such as cheer and spirit teams and golf and archery, um, looking at governing body commissioners, um, athletic counselors, and, and also, you know, not just varsity sports, but club sports. So there are a lot of really great ideas um, in the text chat, and they're still coming in. Um, so thank you all for that. Keep your, your thoughts coming. Brian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it back to you. Yeah, I, it's one of those things when you get into this and you kind of realize we actually need to spoke about three hours. Right. Try to get to all of the information that comes in um, just from everybody that's watching. Um, well, thanks again. Uh, I want to move now to uh, Valencia Peterson, better known Coach V. Um, Coach V, really excited to have you on here and to talk about all the great work that you're doing in Pennsylvania. I, I know that when we were talking about uh, your introduction, you said, the first thing you have is, I'm a football coach. Uh, <laughs> I love that. So you're a football coach, and you're also a trauma-informed educator. Um, but when it also, it's also the top of your accomplishments are helping lead the Penwood Patriots football team to win the 2017 and 2018 Delaware Valley League champions. So <laughs> that's, congratulations. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> congratulations on that. But, uh, that along with it, you, you are also, you, you created your own uh, nonprofit and, and your work that you're doing with the football teams. And I'm really excited to kind of get into it, so I don't want to take up too much time. Um, and we'll leave to this first one, you know, you can also give a little shout out about your, I think you had a write-up in the Huff Post about your program that people yeah. can go and check out and we'll see if we can find it. But tell us yeah. a little bit about the work that you're doing in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. First of all, hello to everybody out there, first and foremost. Uh, I started off doing intervention, right? And um, I was getting pretty discouraged by the fact that I felt like I was always catching up and we were always, inter always intervening instead of being out in the forefront of prevention. And I, too... Uh, started like Ward with coaching boys into men and uh, I had a difficult time I saw some comments on the side about getting coaches involved I totally understand that which led me to be picky but uh, the idea is um, I was able to find a coach and because I was new to the whole prevention thing um, I decided to make a school a pilot project for me so I stayed in one school. Once I found a good coach, I stayed in one school for three years trying to um, 
figure out the best way to get this uh, program off the ground, uh, coaching boys and the men and, 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 and beyond. Because one of the things about me you'll find is I really don't like the one and done thing. I really don't like that. I'm big on relationships. So um, a lot of my young men I've been with, they're in college now. Because I started in 2014 at Penwood. I wasn't a coach at first. But the idea, um, as I got more entrenched in the team and the school, I became the, one of the coaches. So that's been very interesting. Um, so it's been really good to see my young men graduate from high school, go to college, come back to me. And one of the pictures you see there with those four young men, they're on my mini board of ODAP. My young men come back, at, they're in college right now. They come back, I, I got them in high school. They come back and they uh, are helping me to form a better uh, organization in helping young men. So these young men in the other picture that you see there, they're on my mini board. So um, I'm excited about that. And one of the things that I'm doing a little different, you'll find I'm doing something a little different here. I have a camp that I take football teams out to every year. And I started in 2014 taking young men out to a camp, 70 players the first time. And uh, it was great getting them out of the city, didn't have to watch their back. Philadelphia, a lot of violence. I lost one of my players to violence, guns, gun violence. Getting them out of the city and putting them in an environment where they don't have to look over their shoulder. You saw the kid come out in them, which was beautiful to see, which was already therapeutic to begin with. And the idea is we had our summer uh, camp. You know, we have it once a year. And since 2014, I've begun to grow. Now, in 2018, we brought two schools out, and in 2019, we have three schools coming out for our camp. It's three days, two nights, and uh, we're excited about growing uh, as an organization with these teams. There you Excellent. go. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I'm going to move to this, this action slide of you uh, <laughs> out there in the field making it work. Uh, yes, and I definitely. Think that, you know, I love this. I love the, this, I think the quote that you kind of have about it's easier to build strong children than to repair a broken, uh, broken man. And yes. Looking at this, I feel like when you, you, you take that quote and, and then kind of answer this question, why do you think sports the avenue to reach young people, uh, especially in the work that you're doing? Well, this is what I think. Sports football, well done, has all the workings of a good community. With the heavy emphasis on respect, we start to build in the domestic violence piece. Now, I look at sports like a community. You know, here you're taught leadership, teamwork, common goals. You know, you got the makings of a community. What we really need to build in that community is respect, a high level of respect for each other. Sometimes on the team, it's I'm going to get my play, I'm going to get mine. But when we build respect in the team, we have them respecting each other, and then we push it a little further to respecting women and each other. So I, I feel sports is a beautiful, beautiful platform for prevention. I, I've had so many of my young men um, have different circumstances where they've thought about what they were taught. And one thing I, I want to say about this in the area of sports, too, is that um, one of the things that I've put in my program is an accountability system. So if you could just follow me here, when a school decides they want to work with me, and that's how it has to be for me, when a school decides they want to work with me or a team, what we do is, according to Coaching Boys and the Men, we take a pledge. The young men that take a pledge then have accountability partners. These accountability partners hold them to a high standard of how they treat each other and how they treat girls and women. And mind you, I'm with my team. I've been with guys. They're in college now. So I've watched these young men grow up. Um, I know not everybody can do this like this, but I'm very, very uh, intentional on how I'm doing my nonprofit in this area. So the idea is these guys take pledges, they have accountability partners, and then like I was able to go to Howard University not too long ago and talk to the bison there, and we did the exact same thing with them. And I believe that sports is a wonderful platform because you're building leaders already, leaders to lead a team. Now, if you infuse them with the idea of being respectful toward women and girls and each other, then they're going to share that. And I've seen it happen, so I know it happens. 
So I, I really believe sports is a wonderful platform. It has all the makings of a great community. That's how I look at it. That well, makes sense. We, if, if, if we could just go ahead and have you just record that opening part. Uh, my colleague here, David Lee, took a lap around the building uh, in the way that you kind of captured sport as a vehicle for prevention. He's coming back in right now, so I think that was, that was excellent. Um, yeah. You talked about something that I think is really, uh, I think is about your coach, when you take coaches, um, and you talked about how you pick schools. Tell me about how you pick coaches. I know in this picture here you've got the, so a, a, a camp, I think this is a meeting where you were, you, were co you were teaching coaches about the issue, but how do you, right, what's right. the criteria that you look for when you select them and so, decide if they're the right to work with? So this picture is me doing a coach's clinic. I snuck up on them, if you will. Um, they were wondering why I was there, and then I told, I, you know, they found out quick. Um, first of all, I, my thing is quality over quantity. I stayed in that school for three years on purpose. I'm okay with that. I know that I have young men whose lives are changed. I know that. But the way I pick, a, like my motto is quality over quantity. I need a coach that's approachable. Now, I'm a woman, right? And I know a lot of coaches here in Pennsylvania, and they will say to me, Coach V, that coach isn't going to work with you. I know they're not going to work with you. So that eliminates already anybody I'm going to work with. But then there's coaches, the way I find them is word of mouth. The other way I find, like at this particular coach's clinic right here, a gentleman walked up to me and said, we needed you a long time ago at our school. Unfortunately, he had an incident with a young man and he realized he needed this kind of thing and uh, this kind of program in his school. And I'm telling you, he's been a great coach for this year. I just did a um, football um, banquet with that school where uh, the coaches uh, were very grateful for what I had done for them that year. And so I'm picking coaches based on their reputation, number one, from other coaches. I've already set my standard very high. So numbers is not my issue. I want good quality coaches. I, I have to have it that way or my program does not work because I'm building relationships, not feeling statistics, if you will. And that's where I'm a little, I guess, unconventional and grassroots in that way. So my coaches, they have to have be approachable by my players. And I cannot say that enough. I cannot say that enough. They have to be approachable. And then other coaches have to vouch for them. I can tell you stories where I did a, uh, a training for coaches. And one coach, I just think he wasn't thinking or he was just thinking out loud. And he said, I'm an abuser. And I said to him, OK, like, let's work this thing out. You know, I thought he'd have an epiphany. Instead, he just lost, he went. I never saw him again. So I'm not about verbal abuse. You'll. Read the you will read the article in Huffington Post that talks about me going toe to toe with coaches because I don't feel like we need all that heavy cursing to get a guy to perform on the field. So not everybody's going to want to be in my program, honestly, because I'm not, I, I won't stand for that. But the coaches that do, I know that their players are benefiting from it. So that's some of the ways I pick coaches. That's how I pick them. They come to me. And so we did get that link sent out to everybody about the Hub Post article. Yeah, yeah. Coach, just accomplishments that you've had. Uh, oh my gosh! I think, it's, I think, especially, I mean, I think what people would love to hear about the camps. And again, yes. I mean, I, you said it, but you say that you you got Howard University to come. Yes. To football. So I know they changed coaches, but I mean, yeah. Yourself to the company. Can you tell us just kind of for you, whether it's coaches, whether it's players, or just. What are some accomplishments that you've kind of experienced around those camps? Well, one of the things the camp has done uh, for my young men is giving them a safe space. Like I said, we're in an area where they're watching it back. Here you have right here, that's Emotep Charter School right there. They're holding up the uh, two signs for the, the number 11 because they just lost a player from their team. He just got killed. So they're holding up the 11 to to um, honor their friend who just got killed. So uh, this team has lost so many players to gun violence. Mm -hmm. So having them come out to the camp, jump in a lake, swing on a swing, you know, get in a canoe. One young man said to me, what's a canoe? 
right? <laughs> the idea is that they get out of their comfort zone and I'm able to talk with them. I'm able to put them in a safe place. And, you know, when Huff, and so the camp, I'm, I'm really grateful because this year we have three schools coming out there from the weeks of, from July the 18th to the 26th. We'll have three schools out there. As a matter of fact, Futures Without Violence was with us last year. Yesenia and Brian O'Connor, they came out to my camp. That was great. They had a great time talking to the guys and uh, learning from them because they realized this was a little unique to what they had been doing. But when Huffington Post... When Huffington Post found out what, you know, what, what I was doing, Temple University um, and, made, and did an article, Temple University asked me out to talk about what I was doing. Now, I figure if my player can't say what I'm doing, I'm doing nothing. So I took my player there and I said to them, listen, when they asked me, what do you, what's your program? I said, well, I have my player here. I'm going to let him say whatever he's going to say. So my player gets up there. He's not coach. He's just saying from his heart. And he says, I feel really proud. I feel really proud because Miss V is teaching us how to treat women and how to be respectful. And I feel really proud because now I'm teaching my dad. OK, I'm blown away now. Right. Because there is no way that I knew that. And had he not come with me that day, I wouldn't have known that. So accomplishments, it's changed lives. And the thing about me, and it's always been my principle, is that if one person, if one person like gets this, then I know they're going to tell somebody else. And it may not be with me, but it'll be with somebody else. So um, my accomplishments is, is just basically doing life with these guys. Using Coaching Boys and the Men has been great for me. Um, the same, uh, the other thing is Mike London, the head coach of uh, Howard, who was the head coach of Howard, has moved on and he's already sending me, uh, when you come in here, to the next school. So by word of mouth, I believe ODAP will grow in a different kind of way where coaches will come in to me to get my program because it's very good for them. And yes, I am a bit picky about it. So I hope that answers your question. No, that was great, and I think just even talking about how, like, that opportunity for community is how you build that accountability, because when we all realize these opportunities to have fun and be together, we also realize that, hey, look, I've got to look out for the guy next to me. I've got to look out for the people in my community. So I think it's yeah. just a really yeah. amazing opportunity. Coach V, thank you so much. Not only welcome, this, you're welcome. I think informative, but, you, you know, you've got some, like I said, we're going we're gonna to have to record some of these sound bites. And put them up all over the wall. So thank you so much for uh, for being a part of this. So I know Ashley, you had a question you wanted to to share with the group. Yeah. Well, so I think coming off of um, Coach V, can I call you Coach V? You can. <laughs> you can. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> your great success. I mean, just listening to you talk about the work that you've done um, and your passion for athletics and athletes is so apparent. And so I'm wondering what other folks um, have had in terms of success. Uh, with prevention in athletics. And um, there's actually, so um, a colleague of mine, Jody from Wyoming, talked about um, success that, that they've had over in Wyoming with training over 50 coaches in 20 different schools. So I thought I'd highlight that. But we'd love to hear from you all. What are some successes you've seen in prevention in athletics? Um, and I think, Brian, while, while folks kind of think about that and share their successes, we'll move ahead and we'll come back to that to celebrate some of those. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Coach V. Next up, we have Alan uh, Hester Camp. I wanted to uh, I wanted to go ahead and introduce you. You are actually a Reliance grantee, and so we're, we're very thankful for the work you do and also being here. You are the director of the Center for Violence Prevention at the University of Northern Iowa, and you um, have also not only been doing trainings, but you do workshops on gender violence prevention uh, strategies. Uh, you've also worked with bystanders. Uh, and you've done some great work uh, in Iowa being able to get in with the coaches. And I think that's one thing I'm really excited to have you on to talk about that work that you've done. Um, I mean, tell us about the work. Just to start with that, why don't you tell us a little about the work that you are doing um, with the center and, and also just in uh, athletics as a whole. Uh, sure, Brian, and thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of, of this discussion. And I just want to just give a shout out to uh, Valencia and, and Ward 
listening to them um, and hearing uh, their experiences um, with Coaching Boys and Demen, and more importantly, working with uh, young people, it's uh, it's overwhelming. Overwhelming. Uh, just a, a a great opportunity to be a part of this conversation, and I'm really humbled to uh, to join in. Um, Having said that, the Center for Violence Prevention was established in 2011, which was actually the culmination of about 10 years prior to that, of really identifying some of the gaps that existed with uh, a, a comprehensive approach to gender-based violence prevention in our secondary schools. Unlike Ward and Valencia, I come at this work from an entirely different direction, really from the inside. I spent 23 years um, in the Sioux City School District school system, and uh, I was a coach, athletic coach, for 10 years early on in my career when I was teaching. And so, you know, having been a part of the athletic uh, structures and the, um, the all the systems associated with that, um, really from the inside out, has given me a, a pretty good perspective in terms of where we are now and what are some of the challenges that we face, you know, getting schools... Uh, athletic directors and coaches and students to buy into programs like Coaching Boys to Men. So um, it was in my in my role as a high school principal where I was introduced to uh, Coaching Boys to Men, um, and prior to that having worked with uh, the Mentors and Violence Prevention Model. And, and so today those two models, those two programs, both Coaching Boys to Men and Mentors and Violence Prevention, or MVP strategies, um, are two signature programs that the center here at Northern Iowa is currently using as those uh, teaching tools and uh, opportun opportunities to convene with our colleagues in the secondary schools, but also in our colleges and universities across the state. So that is our focus. Um, we are education-based. We are about building capacity. Um, our trainings are uh, a train the trainer, so we are going into communities and partnering with schools, uh, school leadership, community leaders, as well as our domestic violence and sexual assault uh, victim service agencies, where there are a growing number of those agencies who are uh, implementing prevention uh, personnel. Um, on the call here, uh, Anthony James from Waterloo, Iowa, who's a prevention specialist with the Friends of the Family. He's on this call, former collegiate and professional athlete. Um, so recognizing, recognizing those uh, other groups and agencies who play an important role, uh, which goes back to um, uh, the, the initial comments that were made, uh, that, that Ashley made about uh, Prevent Connect, about making those connections. Alan, Alan what is, when you are thinking about uh, getting athletic, or, uh, athletic directors to make uh, activities and programming a priority, I think that's one of the things that people kind of always, you know, they have questions about, like, can you tell us a little bit about that? Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how do you, what, what's the thing? Is it, is it, or is it, is it a thing? Or is it relationships? What is it exactly? Well, you know, getting buy-in and support um, at all levels, um, looking at um, policy and practice, um, networking, collaboration, uh, getting training and education, but also identifying what are the skills and knowledge that we're trying to increase and to expand. Um, I think it's been shared already on this call today um, with the two previous presenters uh, about relationships, really creating that, that trust. And, I, and in my situation, Brian, I, I had some familiarity with the uh, educational and athletic structures in our state that were really the foundation on which all of the athletics in, in secondary schools is based. And so uh, working very closely with the Iowa High School Athletic Association and, and, and connecting with them again. I had been previously on their board several years ago as a young uh, school administrator now on the outside working uh, across the state with agencies wanting to promote violence prevention initiatives, uh, going back and circling back with uh, some new administration, uh, visiting with new colleagues at the Iowa High School Athletic Association, doing some cross-training, um, inviting them to our trainings, conversely being invited to some of their trainings. They have, like most high school athletic associations across the entire state, are wanting to 
really expand the conversations around leadership. And as Ward mentioned, um, we have to include that the aspect of, of leadership and respect um, in our work with violence prevention. And so being able to talk the same talk and the, the same language and pointing to that if we're going to end abuse in one generation, what is the what are the acts of leadership, of courage, of persistence um, that we're going to need to take place amongst our young people, um, amongst those in positions of power and authority right now. And so that's why I, I think those on this um, today on this webinar um, kind of doing a can do, doing a, a check um, it, within their respective uh, communities is what what levels of leadership are they most closely connected to um, in terms of some of the, the, the sports structures, whether that's youth athletics, high school athletics, even collegiate athletics, um, and how are they currently um, uh, connected with or in, engaged with in some respect with those organizations. And so what, that's what we have that's what I've been working on here over the last five or six years as to how to increase that capacity for uh, support. And that's uh, you know, leveraging um, high-profile athletic directors and coaches um, in our state who have gone through the, the, the trainings, uh, capturing their thoughts and their comments on video and been, being, able, being able to use those comments um, to share you know, with social media um, are, are some pretty powerful ways to kind of expand and, and, and grow the conversation, uh, which Coaching Boys to Men really requires. You, we're going to post something up here in a second of some videos that, uh, uh, that you have um, that just really kind of show how coaches, you know, are mentoring, how they're talking about how they're reinforcing some of those positive behaviors. You know, at, uh, at the National Sexual Assault Conference this year, uh, we talked a little bit about this, just getting that buy-in by coaches and getting that right, getting that coach that everybody respects is kind of that first step. Can you just talk a little bit about just how you got the buy-in of the program of coaches? Not just to kind of reinforce the values of it, but just to, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's, it's even opening the door to allow other coaches to feel comfortable coming in and seeing that they can make this a part of their work and their efforts to help young people. Right. I mean, that's that's such an important uh, aspect. and and. Part of it is, is the, the word of mouth, and, and you know Valencia mentioned this in her comments, but through, through my contacts with the uh, school administrators of Iowa and the um, Iowa High School Athletic Association, as well as with other, other school administrators, um, we were able to identify in those, those coaches and athletic directors across the state of Iowa who, who at some point in time had shared a, shared a comment or an interest or ask a question at a coaches meeting or an athletic meeting that that um, it really informed my colleagues at the Iowa High School Association that that this is this is this may be a coach or an athletic director who would be very open to uh, discussing how coach boys to men could really add some value to what they were already doing with their young men um, athletically and extracurricular activities um, at their respective schools. So it, it really has been. Um, getting into those networks where uh, coaches and athletic directors um, revolve, and whether that's at, at, at state conferences or, or district or conference meetings, um, one of the one of the powerful tools that we've been able to take advantage of here at the Center for Violence Prevention is um, going to and, and and observing and visiting with students, student athletes, both male and female identified and coaches um, at convenings or conferences that were hosted by the Iowa High School Athletic Association about, about communication and leadership, generally speaking. And so during some of those early conferences years ago, we were able to, with, their, with the um, support of my colleagues in that organization, we were able to start sprinkling in some of the, the, the activities and discussions around gender-based violence prevention and, and con connecting it to leadership and the bystander approach and, and really making it more personal. So we were trying to add to already the values and the purpose statements that these uh, school districts have. And every school, every school district has value statements, purpose statements, um, particularly as it relates to extracurricular activities. You know, things that, are, things that are connected to character development in young people, social emotional learning, uh, teamwork, problem solving, community service, citizenship. I mean, we need, we need to tie our, 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 our strategies of prevention 
to those exact same values because we're talking uh, the, the same the, the same language there. Now, now this let's, let's round this this round this development this social emotional learning out to not only include good citizenship, uh, character, respect, but also uh, standing up for and challenging uh, harmful and abusive language when you hear and see it amongst your teammates, your classmates, and your friends. Do you, you talked in the beginning, just as, as, as you said at first, just about uh, contacts. Do you, if people maybe they don't have those contacts, do you? I, I would, I, I'm kind of wondering. Do you think people are more open now as administrators or in some of these associations to taking those phone calls? Maybe it's not so much a cold call, but just kind of an introduction. Do you think that we kind of moved to a place where that that people are are open to hearing those types of things and and and, and maybe a way to, for people to. to I guess what I'm saying is don't give up hope that you can call and, and try to make, create some of these contacts that people are more open. Do you think that's the case? I absolutely know that's, that that's happening right now. And I, I can give you an example. Just, just north of us in, in Minnesota, the Minnesota Athletic Association has really been a leader in really requiring, yeah. requiring training around these topics of uh, gender-based violence prevention and leadership, um, consent, et cetera. Um, with their coaches, and that director in the, Minis the state of Minnesota uh, ha talks directly with the directors here in Iowa, and at their regional and national convenings, their, their national conferences, they're starting to hear, and, and this, is, this topic is starting to seep in more and more at that discussion. And I'll tell you, one, that there's, I believe there's, there's two uh, forces that are kind of helping that uh, manifest itself. One is these, are, these conversations are growing within the NCAA, so colleges and universities are talking about these issues with their athletes more often than they were five or ten years ago. That is trickling down to and is being communicated to uh, high school athletics that these are important topics to pay attention to and to understand and to ask ourselves, what are we doing to contribute to the educational learning process um, with our young men and young women across the state? So that's, that's one piece. The second piece is you have you have a lot of high-profile former or current athletes that are, and, um, I'm thinking of, of Joe Ehrman as one, who has made it his, you know, lot in life to, you know, at, to, to get in front of as many coaches and athletic directors as possible and to talk about the importance of these issues. So when you add just those two examples together, Brian, you're, you're seeing and we're, we're experiencing um, – uh, a, a themes and topics that are emerging more and more often um, in regional and state conferences with multiple um, athletic sectors. So, Alan, where do you go next? How do you how are you going to grow this uh, going forward? As far as you know, just continue to do the great work in Iowa. What's next? Well, I tell you what, I'm going to convince Valencia to move to Iowa. Number one. Um, <laughs> I, we uh, would be a you know, powerful duo. <laughs> oh, so I'm telling you. Uh, uh, no, when when you have when you put passion behind this, and I, I don't know, Valencia, when you were talking, I and Ward as well. You know, there was a parent coming out when you spoke as well. I, you know, I, I'm a parent uh, tapping into our. Tapping into our paternal instincts, tapping into our professional um, connections, um, speaking about this stuff with passion. Um, certainly, relationships um, is such an important piece to growing and and then and then telling the story. So, Brian, I guess it, in short, I would say is how do you grow this? Is we continue to um, assess and evaluate uh, as much as we can what what our coaches are telling us. And I see I, I see you have the slide here about the impact. Um, how is this impacting our coaches? Um, what are they saying about the trainings? What are they saying about having gone through the experience of, of um, actually standing with and sitting with their athletes and having these, these conversations that many of them had not had before? This is, this is life-changing. This is transformational coaching at its best, right? Um, but th this is what we're trying to achieve. We know the model works. We, we were a part of the – I was a part of the uh, pilot study for Coaching Boys to Men back in 2007 before it – was studied and evaluated more thoroughly in Sacramento. I mean, we knew back in 2006, 2007 that this model would work, that, and the research backs it up. Um, but it's yeah. it's really about how is it changing the culture and the the, the coaching practices, and and really communicating to coaches that that this would be a, this is a natural part of what it means to help uh, help young men uh, grow and develop into the kind, respectful, empathetic, 
nurturing, loving, strong men that we want them to yeah. be. And it be, it's a natural it's a natural part of their of who they are as human beings. And we're we're just yeah. tapping into that. We're giving voice to it. We're giving some some ways in which to kind of talk about it, some talking mm-hmm. points. Mm-hmm. But it's about the conversation. It's about it's about letting kids you know, share with you what's on their mind and heart and, and doing it, in, as Valencia said, in a safe place where they don't have to, you know, put this tough guy's mask on and right. think they can be real. And, and coaches can model that. Coaches can, can, can model and, and, and show them that, that, that men of integrity and of character and of compassion um, can be strong on the athletic field, can be competitive, can love, love winning championships, uh, but we're also really, really good at showing compassion and, and, and love and support for um, our coaches, our teammates, our friends, our family members. And so planting a seed, I, I think. And I, there's a quote here on this slide that you have, Brian, up at the bottom there from a coach, you know, just reflecting out loud and thinking to himself that it's a subject matter that I hadn't really thought much about until this training was available. And so you, I, I never walk into a training um, um, without coming or thinking about that we're planting seeds. I can't predict what each of these coaches is going to do, you know, three months, four months, a year, two years from now. But I know that we're in the business of of planting seeds, doing some follow-up, encouraging them, like Ward said, uh, dropping in, shooting them an email, giving a call on the phone, having someone connect with them. Um, It's it's all of those those strategies combined together really – built a community of support, kind of a, a, a community of practice, if you will, around um, this, this model. Alan, thank you. Uh, I think that, you know, I love that quote at the bottom. I think that's just so important. And, I mean, just the, the effect that uh, leaders in athletics have on young people's lives, um, it really does trickle down. If they come in with that mindset and they come in with the training, if they come in with the opportunity, they're, they're going to teach um, the lessons that are going to carry on um, beyond just the field. So I, I, I love that quote at the bottom. Um, thank you all three of you for uh, talking about your organizations and your work. And we have a couple questions that we're going to run through just and, and bring kind of everybody together um, and, and just do the uh, – we're going to bring Ashley back in here in a second. Um, we, we're, we're continuing to take you all's questions, and I see that people are also connecting on the chat. So just please, this, this is exactly what we want. So uh, and we appreciate our presenters uh, also interacting with you. So we're going to throw it back to Ashley real quick uh, to go over some of these questions. Thanks, Brian. I actually I just wanted to go back to that text chat question where we asked people about their successes um, because there were some that came up that I think um, are re- worth pointing out. So in Colorado. Um, there, an agency is, uh, has partnered with current and former players from the Denver Broncos, Colorado Rockies, and some other sports teams to do some ads. Um, and then also there's a partnership with the Broncos on their True Man program, which teaches healthy masculinities and relationship skills to middle school um, football teams. And then over in Napa, California, um, they are able to host a coach clinic, um, and now there are uh, coaches ready to develop the department um, prevention program. And then over uh, in Pennsylvania, Penn State is partnering, um, or the Penn State Athletics um, are being trained to facilitate multi-session programs at middle schools. Which uh, brings us, there's a, there's a question in the chat from Margaret asking if there's a clinic for training college athletes to do lessons with middle school and high school teams. So for those of you who have that as a success, um, maybe you can connect with Margaret and share what you all are using. Um, but yeah, those are some of the successes that I saw come up, Brian. So then we have one more kind of question we want to throw out to everybody just to kind of uh, after the discussion, just, you know, what are some of the other ways that you can get buy-in from coaches and administrators for domestic violence and sexual violence prevention? What are some of those things to try to pull people in and get them to see the important role that they can play? Um, so we'll, we'll collect those, and we did want to go on to our last few questions that we wanted to bring the group back together to kind of talk through. Um, and, you know, Guys, one of the things that as, as you're talking, uh, and, and I think all three of you have passion and people get excited, but I think one of the questions 
that kind of comes up. Sorry, actually, only a minute. But one, of the, one of the questions that I think uh, accident, that, that come up is, and it's not just about coaching voice and the period. When you start thinking about evaluating the effectiveness of programs, what are some things, uh, and, you know, Alan, if we could start with you, what are some things to, that, that you think um, are important when you're trying to look at that effectiveness of the program? Sure. I mean, there, there's a, a lot of really great pieces to to want to kind of monitor or at least probe, and you know, we, we've done a few of that. I, again, we're, we're not trying to reevaluate the model itself. We know we know the model works, but what we're trying to, or in terms of our follow-up, um, you know, three months, two months, uh, you know, half, uh, six months, a year later, um, with some of our coaches, is just uh, identifying: do they still coming off of a coming off of a coaching experience or a training experience? There's a lot of enthusiasm. There's some ahas that are, that are made. How to what extent is that sticking? How how much is that interest and in that kind of rethinking my coaching uh, approach to coaching changing? And so this slide is just again a couple of things to be mindful of. What what we know is that the training of other men together, and we've had women uh, who are coaching men, young boys in our schools as well. So our, our trainings have been mixed. Um, with men and women both, um, but it, what it is is it's helping give them some skills, particularly in the area of resources. One, one of the strategies to help, I think, and Ward mentioned this as well, um, getting the uh, local domestic and or sexual violence prevention specialists um, invited to the training as a part of the co-trainer. Um, we've, worked, we've worked across the state in, in our uh, work to make those connections and putting a face um, with the local uh, sexual assault or domestic violence agency um, there so that the coaches can meet this person. Oftentimes, this advocate or this prevention specialist may already be presenting in health classes or in, in cer certain classes in that high school or middle school, so they have some familiarity with the, some of the school staff, but most of them have not had a face-to-face -face conversation with, with coaches. And it's so it, it kind of informs the coaches that, wow, that there are some really awesome community services and community agencies that are doing awesome work with our kids and our kids' families. And so, again, we're just making those connections and to bring some familiarity. But our coaches really feel empowered to know more, uh, you know, know those resources that they didn't know before. And, and some language, Brian, some language and some comments of how we can talk to boys about preventing violence against women and girls and, and how we can, you know, hold each other accountable in, in ways that we haven't done before. Ward, uh, once you do either one of you have uh, anything you want to add to that? Well, one, one of the things that um, I'm kind of a stickler on, on making sure that the, the coaches do the evaluations, the pre and post season uh, evaluations. Uh, it doesn't always work. Um, sometimes, um, you know, they get busy, um, particularly at the end of the season. If they go into post, uh, if they go into postseason play, it can be challenging for them to to wrap it up. Um, but the the evaluation tools that that Futures Without Violence provides with coaching boys and men, I've found to be very effective. Um, and then also, again, similarly, kind of like getting. Um, Measuring the temperature with folks who are supporters of that particular community, and and so like um, boosters, uh, people in leadership, uh, non-athletes in the community, asking them specifically, have you seen a change in in the attitudes? Have you seen a, a difference? And and one of the folks that we asked when we were doing uh, programming with O'Day was to uh, go to their sister school across town. Uh, O'Day High School is an all-boys Catholic school. There's an all-girls uh, uh, Catholic school across town, and they, they do mixers and events throughout the year. And what we noticed uh, from the folks that were governing those programs is that complaints of inappropriate behavior, sexual harassment, et cetera, had gone down dramatically since O'Day began um, implementing coaching boys into men five years ago. And for me, um, Alan, I had a, I had a, we had a. Oh, go ahead. Valencia, please, no, go ahead. Well, Valencia, no, 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 please. Well, one of the things that I'm doing is if a if a coach commits to working with me, 
Um, they also have to commit to at least me visiting them three times. In the beginning of the program, well, we set, you know, we build a rep, you know, a reputation with the players and a relationship with them. And then in the middle of the season, I come back to that team because in the beginning of our time together, we've got willingly accountability partners now. So by the time I come back in the middle of the season, I'm checking on the accountability partners. How is it going? What are some of the problems? And they're talking to me about and working through problems. At the end of the season, I come back. And in between this, coaches know that they can call me 24-7, text me, email me if there's a problem that's coming up. If there's a problem, I go back there and I have a session with the coaches and the young men. So I'm available to them and, you know, they can contact us and we will be there to help them. They don't have to go through any red tape, just call us and we'll be there. And then um, at the end of our time together in the season, as the season comes to a close, one thing we've been able to do is give a $500 scholarship to the young man on the team that the coaches deemed has lived out our principles. We would love to give more, but we're not just we're not there yet. But at the end of the year, we go back and we give a scholarship to the young man who's lived these principles, according to the coach. So it's a lot of keeping in contact for us. It's a lot of um, it's a lot of making ourselves available to those coaches. And the way we've measured success also is they're clamoring to get back with us. We can't wait to next year is their words. You know, they want they're, they're coming back. They're re-enrolling because one thing I didn't think we said, and I think it's important to note that with coaching boys and the men, you have a set of cards that you go through. If you, like me, are with the same team for four years, they know those cards. So now we're looking for teachable moments to build upon. So by us being accessible, if a teaching, if a teachable moment comes up, they can call us and we'll go and we'll use that moment to do further to further uh, coaching boys and men to build on it on another level, if that makes sense. So that's one of the ways qualitatively we are me uh, monit uh, monitoring our success. Excellent. Hey, Alan, really quickly, someone asked, like, what methods did you use to evaluate for the end of training and follow up uh, how the program impacted coach athletes' team conversations? Right. So there's a couple that uh, surveys that we use. One is the one prepared by uh, that we use with futures, and Ward just referenced that um, as well. And that those, you know, those are downloadable, uh, free online to use with the, the coaches. Um, we've developed a follow-up survey that if someone would email wants to email me, I would be happy to to share that with them. So um, mostly by uh, by survey method. Excellent. So we're gonna we're gonna ask the group one more question so that we can allow, allow some time to take some questions uh, from everybody in the audience. Um, Warren, start with you, uh, and I think this is a question that is, is really important that people uh, want to learn. What are some of the roadblocks you overcame along the way, when not just when you were implementing the program, but even when you have current programming that you run into and that you've had to overcome along the way? You know, I think. Um, <laughs> One of the things that, that I think is really easy, uh, it, it's easy to get cynical and discouraged, um, but I think it's uh, assuming positive intent, even in the face of uh, controversial evidence. You know, like when, when you're engaging a coach that um, uh, may, may seem resistant or not quite ready for, for full engagement, um, my experience, or when they've been implementing the program and then all of a sudden go radio silent, uh, is to assume that it's not about the personal relationship as much as it is about their business, um, and that, that's just one thing. The, the other thing, I think, is to take an interest in and a commitment to supporting uh, the wide range of, of uh, responsibilities that they have, helping out um, in any way. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, a couple of schools have me do is come in and mid-season, give a talk um, about uh, about their roles as leaders in the community, that the student athletes' le roles as leaders in the community, um, and, and can, you know, join that in conjunction with the, the coaches and celebrate the efforts the coaches are making in, in bringing that out. And I think the other thing is just looking for opportunities to celebrate 
coaches that do sustain, sustained effort over time. We've, um, we, we recently recruited a, a member of our local ESPN radio station to our board at LifeWire, and that has resulted in opportunities with some of the professional uh, sports leagues around the, the city and in providing incentives uh, and, and um, a chance to, to celebrate coaches who do sustained work year over year so that they can get like a suite at a Seahawks game or uh, a meeting with Coach Carroll or something like that. So those, those are some of the things that I think are important. <clears throat> Coach B, how about you and some of the roadblocks that you've, uh, you've had to overcome or, 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 or have popped up along the way? Uh, first of all, being a female has been an issue sometimes with coaches, um, and that's sad, honestly. But uh, I've learned that, you know, those coaches who are supposed to be a part of my program and our program will be, and it will be good. That's how I look at it at this point. Um, but I would love to have a lot more buy-in with our local sports teams here. In, in Philadelphia, honestly. Uh, and I believe we'll get to it, but it's just a, a, a process that you have to go through. Sometimes there's a lot of red tape in areas, but we're just calmly getting through them slowly but surely as everybody sees the effectiveness of our program with our young men. Alan, how about you, uh, Roadblock? Yeah, I, I when when Ward was talking at the early on in his discussion uh, about just what's on the plate of coaches and, and schools and, and administrators, I, I can relate to that having been there. And so I think our, some of our biggest challenges have been um, identifying uh, the time, the openings in schedules, um, some more administrative challenges, I think, would be the case. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, right now, Coach Boys to Men is something that's being uh, heavily promoted by our uh, high school athletic association and one day I would hope to think that at some point in time we could get to a place like Minnesota where these are um, conversations that are required of all individuals who have an interest and a passion to work with young young people in, in, in sports uh, in Iowa and we're not there yet um, so but I do think that that that's something in our near future that uh, we'll continue to pursue here. So we're gonna we're gonna open this uh, up and, and see if we have a few questions. Uh, Ashley, do you know if we have any questions that people have been wanting that we can maybe throw out to the group uh, in the last uh, five minutes that we have? Yeah, I mean, I want to thank Ward because Ward did head over to the text chat and was answering some of the questions that had come up. Um, I think there was. Um, a question, and this is kind of a big question, but it was around implementing programs um, in athletic programs when um, like LGBTQ students are being forced to join either a boys team or a girls team. You know, how do, how do we handle that? Um, and so I don't know if the presenters have any ideas or if anyone in the audience has um, had that situation come up and has navigated through that. But that would be a question. <laughs> Either one, anybody want to take a shot at that? Well, this is this is Alan. We in our coach boys to men um, implementation and trainings have we and we have uh, female identified students that wrestle. Um, and uh, now in Iowa, there's a, a, a brand new. Um, um, Women's League of Wrestling, if you will, they had their very first state champion tournament, state state tournament here this past um, week. But prior to that, yes, they've they've competed against um, with with the boys. Um, I, I would just remind folks that the the research that was completed on Coach Boys to Men in Sacramento included a, a significant number of female students who were um, involved in the cross country uh, teams that were a part of that. Uh, national study and others as well. So there is there, there's some some data and literature about that um, with regards to women and girls. But I was going to say that in our um, 
Mentors Advanced Prevention model, uh, we have student facilitators and we oftentimes, what we do mixed and same uh, gender groups oftentimes, um, those students who identify as LGBTQ um, are really in having conversations um, with groups with whom they are most closely aligned and, and feel compelled to want to share. And because we're talking about violence being perpetrated against others, and we're talking from the bystander approach, um, we all kind of uh, breathe in the same toxic air oftentimes of power and privilege, and we see that, and we've, some of us have experienced it directly and indirectly. And so we've noticed that it, it hasn't changed the conversation in terms of what my role and responsibilities are, but also to whom are the to whom are the uh, the words, the innuendos, the comments, the abuse? To whom are they being um, disproportionately impacting? And there's where we've had some incredible testimonies and some amazing uh, uh, LGBTQ voices um, uh, feel the courage and the support to share their stories to others, and have been uh, have, have been very very powerful and very moving and educational for uh, the students and the adults. As for me, I am actively Thank seeking. So much, can I? As for me in this area, just quickly, I am actively seeking a girl kicker for my football team. Everybody in the school knows I'm looking for one <laughs> to be our kicker. So I'm I'm raring, uh, ready to see this whole thing happen. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, unfortunately, I think, Brian, that we've kind of come yeah. to the end, but I, I, the good news is, for everybody <laughs> joining us, is that this is not the only web conference we'll be doing with Reliance around athletics and sport and sexual and domestic violence prevention. No, I think we're going to, not only are we taking these questions down, we're going to use it, find a way that we can kind of create the next uh, webcast around this, and, and, and again, we've had some great guests, and how can we continue to get some great people on here so that we can continue to offer you the opportunity to learn. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. I also want to thank Alan, Warren, and Valencia for being here. We put your contact information up. We will be posting uh, this webcast up on the Reliance, the Sports Prevention Center, and Prevent Connect, as well as on YouTube, and so we will also make sure that uh, you will have an opportunity to rewatch this again. Again, I want to thank our guests, and I want to thank the involvement of everybody as well as the sharing uh, that's going on on the chat, and we will see you down the road. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. And um, just one last thing. So we will be sending out an evaluation survey um, in the next couple of minutes, and we'd really appreciate you to take a few minutes to respond to that. It's so, so useful for us, um, and there is an opportunity for you to receive a certificate of attendance upon completion of that. Um, as Brian said, we did record this, and when that recording is available, we'll go ahead and send an email out to you so you know that that is ready for you to view and to share. Um, but again, thank you so much to all of our amazing guests. Thank you, Brian, for being here. Thank you to my uh, Prevent Connect colleagues, and most importantly, thanks to you all in our audience for um, joining and being part of this conversation, and we'll see you next time. Have a good rest of your Wednesday. <laughs> this uh, will conclude our Prevent Connect.